The second question is Thora a poisoner? For a minute there I thought it said prisoner, but no. Okay, let's try to figure this one out myself instead of uh, Hercule little brain cells or whatever he calls them. Is he a poisoner? Okay, Thor left the letter behind. It doesn't say anything. There was a poison rat at the scene of the crime. Thor had ordered rat poison. Lady Clark thinks that Thora Gray tried to poison her. There we go. Dr. Logan's letter stipulates that Lady Clark only has one year left to live. Lady Clark thinks that Thora Gray is manipulative. Okay. Oh, this is wrong. Come on. All right, she never considered it. Thor Gray had no reason to kill someone who only had a few months left to live. <laughs> the poison she ordered was for rats. The gardener must have made good use of it, considering the stinking remains on the pass not far from the property. <laughs> I've finished here. I must put the skeleton key back and inform Hastings that I'm returning to London. All right, so we established she didn't poison the old woman. Where does that put us? That Thora is innocent of everything. Okay, so our new objective is to call Hastings. He still walks like an idiot. Look at that. Why are you moving your arms like a weird way? His walk changes on a regular basis. At least that's the feeling I got. All right, let's head in, or you're gonna get you cold. Away from the pissing sound. And into, uh, what, what do we need to do? Phone? Telephone. Telephone Hastings. Is, is that like a, a word? Telephone? Like an active way? Uh, where's the phone? It must be here. But it ain't. So where the, in, may, oh there, you idiot. It's over here. I must put the skeleton key back and inform Hastings that I'm returning to London. You must put the skeleton, where do I put that back? How do we... This skeleton key would be very useful for opening the locks I have not yet been able... But where did I put it? Where, where did I get it from? From this thing? I've finished with this subject. No. Then... then what? Maybe here? Did you get it from here? No. Okay, tell me. I'm kind of rusty. Like I said, it's been two weeks. <laughs> I'm not sure where did, did I... Okay, I got it from the tiger's mouth. Perfect. Nothing else is keeping me here. All right, now we got that, that out of the way. Let's try to avoid the clue system again and do it by myself. After I've left this house, I'm pretty much done with this. Hello, Hastings. I have finished in Shurston. I will take the first train. Tell me, do you know how to restore writing on a burnt document? Yes, you just have to soak a cloth with a hydrochloric acid solution and rub the sheet of paper. Then the characters appear. Bien. You have been of great assistance, Hastings. Could you please order the solution as soon as possible? Of course, but what documents do you want to read? You will see, my friend. À ce soir. Donald Fraser is here. He insisted on waiting to see you. All right, talk to Donald. Hungarian moustache. I really wanted that trophy. Still chapter three. I have here the burned documents. Burned sheets if of paper. Someone has tried to get rid of these documents. They may be important. Yes. Hastings did know that, so he isn't that useless, I guess. Burn sheets of paper found in the garden of the Clark's mansion. I am certain that it is the work of the killer. Their content is essential for the investigation. 
But first, let's hear Donald out and talk to Hastings. Poirot, since my return, I see that you have fewer grayer hairs than when I last saw you. How is that possible? Mon ami, I am sure that you will find the explanation all on your own. That again. They always talk about their hair. Hastings, mm, for your hair. Yes? There exists an accessory, how shall I say, that can be fastened to the scalp and covered with your own hair. Let me be quite clear, it is not a wig. Come on, Poirot, I'm not losing my hair. It's just thin slightly. And again with the hair. You both got moustaches. Yeah, they're, they're... I don't know what to say. They're very idle. Anything new here? Royal Mathematical and Statistical Society's Bulletin, September the 9th, 1935. The Alphabet Murder, a Methodical Madman. I guess that's new. What it's about... highly probable that the Alphabet Murderer will kill again. Could we possibly estimate the number of victims in his next crime? Yes, and it is easy, as soon as we know the ratio of towns, cities and villages whose names begin with a D, and the ratio of English people whose names are spelled the same. On the one hand, the ratio of towns, cities and villages in England with the name starting with D, and on the other hand, the ratio of English people with a name also starting with D. After this initial calculation, it is easy to deduce the likelihood of actually being murdered if you belong to the target population. Go to the last page to find our results and details on the calculations. <laughs> okay, you read it all, fine. And Donald is making a weird drinking sound at the background. Uh, let's read the other one. Daily Blague. August 31, 1935. Moustache at half mast. Poirot's repeated failure in ABC case. Sometimes nice. small things trouble great men. Hastings, faithful collaborator of the Belgian detective, knows something about it. Three mornings in a row, he confided to us, the cook broke the egg yolks when preparing Poirot's breakfast. This apparently casual event has greatly disturbed my friend, to the point it breaks his concentration and slows his judgment. I also noticed his moustache, of which he's so proud, being duller than usual. Poirot, I assure you I haven't said any such thing to the journalists. They twist everything. Hmm... Well, it's gonna leave a dent. On its self-esteem, uh, there's still one clue left, so I wonder what what that one is. Daily blague, August. Sometimes. Okay, you read it already. This apparently cat. They're saying hurtful things about his uh, mustache. Okay, I'm royal. No, 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 no! Crap. That wasn't my ID, but then I clicked it. I want to back out. Good. All right. So someone insulted him. That's not good. So let's look at it yourself again, Hercule. You know, you, you got to do your thing here. Yeah, put it right. It was only touching his eye. Oh, three ego points. Look at that. Okay, let's talk to the man. Oh, this let's... man is tired. He's always tired, and he's drinking it again. Dark circles. Unshaven and drinking. Donald is short of sleep, and it looks as if he didn't even bother to undress before going to bed. Maybe it was cold. Ooh. This bottle is for our visitors. Personally, I prefer the sherry. What about the pen? Or the cookies? Okay, let's talk. 
Mr. Pado, I don't know why I'm here. You are... Is he guilty? No, not yet. Or maybe he is. Let's become impatient. You wanted to talk, and you came to find the only man capable of hearing you. Mr. Pado, since Betty's death, I have doubts about myself. I don't know what to do. And I keep having a horrible dream three nights in a row. Okay, I actually didn't become impatient because I hit the wrong button there. I chose A. But now I got another chance to become impatient. Encourage him. Point out that it's not a... You know, this time I'm really becoming impatient. Well, what are you waiting for? Tell me about your dream. It's always the same. I'm on the beach with Betty. I grab her around the throat and I squeeze and squeeze until she's dead. Her head falls back and I see that it's no longer Betty. It's Megan's face. Have you seen Megan Barnard recently? Yes, our grief has brought us together. I never really knew her before. She's really quite a remarkable girl. But I would never tell her about my dream. Why not? Is it her you are attacking in your dream? No, it's Betty. And once Betty is dead, it's Megan's face that appears in its place. Very interesting. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Okay, this again. <clears throat> I'm kind of confused. Who's Betty again and Megan? Um, <clears throat> those are the sisters, right? How should Donald's dream be interpreted? This one is a tough one. I can sense it. The two murders were premeditated, premeditated and were carried out by the same murderer. <sighs> what? It's like a vision? Let's put it in there. Just for now. Donald was very much in love with Betty. But he tried to kill her. her. So that doesn't add up. Donald was a violent man. Could be, could be. Donald does not kill Megan in his dream. Well, that's not entirely true, is it? Donald is tired. Donald feels guilty about killing Betty. That could be. Donald really likes Megan. I think this is it. Or is it? Okay. This one is hard, like I told. Okay, I think this one is right. He likes Megan. This doesn't seem to be right. Feels guilty about killing Betty. Did he kill Betty? No, no, no. Put that back. He was very much in love with Betty? No. Uh, okay, that's, that's not right. So this mustn't be right, this either. Uh, was he a violent man? I don't know. I think this one. Yeah, guessing. Mr. Fraser, I think that the real meaning of this dream is that you are in love with Megan Barnard. Please go on. Do. This dream certainly betrays your guilt. Oh. But what do you feel guilty about? Having killed your fiancé? Possible. Or forgetting her very quickly for her sister? Certainly. And this forgetting is perceived as a second death. 
So you don't really think I was the one who killed Betty? I do not exclude this theory. I am simply saying that I do not need to know that fact to explain your dream and your guilt. Thank you for being frank, Mr. Poirot. You've helped me a great deal. I'm going back to Bexhill. I'll not take any more of your time up. It is late, Mr. Fraser, and you are tired. I'll sleep on the train. I like trains. It's easy to sleep rocked by the sound of the wheels. Poor boy, he seems completely lost. Well, women seem to like him. I think Megan will take care of him. Oh, I remember. Did you order the product I needed? Yes, we'll be receiving it tomorrow. Bien, it is late, and ask Miss Gray to come tomorrow morning. I have a few questions I wish to ask her. Mademoiselle, I asked you here in order to answer a very important question. All right, so now we're with Thora Gray, who appears to be innocent, according to the old mansion uh, scene stuff. <clears throat> All right, remind her that she did not see anybody on the day of the murder. Accuse her of having lied. Accuse her of being a killer. Um, let's play nice, because I'm not really sure what she is yet. Am I right in thinking you said that you did not speak to anyone on the day Sir Carmichael was murdered? It's the absolute truth. Yet, Lady Clark maintained that she saw you talking to a stranger on the front doorstep. Really? She must have been mistaken. Oh, I remember now. I'd forgotten all about it, but it wasn't important. It was just a salesman. One of those traders who sell stockings from door to door. Can you describe him to me? Medium size, mm, glasses, dark suit, and a felt hat. Not the sort of man you notice. Completely harmless. That's why I forgot all about him. Nothing else? He was very hesitant and shy. Usually door-to-door -door salesmen are very confident. But he wasn't. That's our guy. Our killer. All right. Indicate that she lied about leaving Churston. Ask whether she resigned of her own free will. Point out that her departure is suspicious. Let's go with the uh, free will option. You did not leave Churston willingly, I believe. I don't wish to lie. Lady Clark did not appreciate my presence. And Franklin cannot go against the wishes of a sick lady. He is a good man, and he worries a great deal about his sister-in-law. I noticed that you left some personal belongings behind at Churston. Ask if she will collect the objects, ask she will return to Churston. Let's say they presented a risk. It was too risky for you to keep these objects, am I correct? Risky? What was the risk? Oh, I guess that's the wrong answer. Accuser of holding the murder weapon. Say that the curse of a dragon is on. <laughs> oh, I could try that. It would make Poirot an idiot. Say Lady Clark would have accused her of theft. Uh, let's just have some fun and let's say the curse of the dragon. Keeping the brooch might have brought the curse of the dragon on you. What? The curse of the dragon? It's a good subject for a story. Mr. Poro, what sort of world do you live in? Yeah. I must ask you one last question. Please reply frankly with either yes or no. If Lady Clark had died, would you have agreed to marry Sir Carmichael if he'd ask you? How dare you ask such a question? Sir Carmichael treated me just like his daughter. And all that I ever felt him was affection and gratitude, nothing else. Thank you, mademoiselle. I will not keep you any longer. I met Thora Gray on the stairs. Her cheeks were ablaze and she appeared to be deeply hurt. Poirot, have you offended the poor girl again? Do you have good reasons for accusing her? I accused her of nothing, Hastings. I simply asked her an important question she did not answer. Let us see if we can answer it for her. 